with somebody because a lot of times everybody has their own opinion. Why, and why do we say that? Well, because it can cause controversy. Somebody's going to get upset. Somebody's going to get offended. This is one of those conversations that as a preacher, a lot of times, you know, you think about it and you try to make sure that everything you say is going to be in a way that's received, that I'm not going to do something that's going to cause somebody to be insulted because of my ignorance and not phrasing things right, that I really hope that, you know, you listen and be able to understand what I'm saying. And I'm not saying what I say out of hate or anger. Um, you know, a lot of times it's just tone when you're talking to somebody, isn't it? When you talk to somebody and you're trying to express a differences between, maybe you don't agree with them. And, and this idea right here, this buzzword that we talk about is unity and diversity. And now, years ago, it had a completely different meaning. It was really interesting, you know, because I, I believe in unity and being diverse. Don't get me wrong. I think that there is some amazing things that when we are diverse, our unity makes us so strong. Our nation, this nation, used to be called what? Melting pot. Now, it didn't come easy. <laughs> You know, it wasn't accepted that well. There was a lot of different immigrant waves that came into our country at different times, starting with the Italians and then the Irish and then all the way through, then the Germans and, you know, these different waves that come in. And, and it's been difficult because of why? Because of that diversity side of it. We're different. My cultural values are not the same as yours. And, and learning that, you know what, your, your cultural value has something really cool, something that can bring more value together. When I was in the Army National Guard, one of the most amazing things to me was the idea that you have all these guys that one week in a month, you'd put on a uniform and you would play soldier and we would go off and we'd go to some fort or two weeks out of the year. And one time we were sitting around and I had this Army captain come up to me. I was a platoon leader. And he saw all these guys in my unit. We're all sitting around. We're playing army. You know, we're in a combat environment out in the woods. And this captain walks up to me. And he saw all my guys. And he said, do you speak Spanish? And I went, because we're from New Mexico. And then I looked around. And I go, these are guys. These are all Mexicans. I'm the, I'm the only white guy here. And I thought, I said, well. And I just jokingly said, yeah. I say, no work, no dinero. You know, and the guy looked at me like, and my platoon sergeant was sitting right beside me. He started laughing. And I said, sir, I said, if you look around here, that guy sitting over there, he's a lawyer. The guy over there, he's an electrician. The guy over there is a school teacher in Deming, New Mexico. And I went around and started pointing out all these guys. And I thought, you know, there were times that, yeah, okay, maybe we couldn't soldier as hard as those regular army guys. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I would take my guys because of that diversity of all the things that they brought throughout the rest of their week, their days. And that made us very strong. Our nation is strong. Our church is strong because of it. The kingdom of God is stronger and better because of the Gentiles, <laughs> the, the, the babblers, the, you know, the the pagans that they said that came together and the Jews had a hard time with that, didn't they? With accepting this idea of, of not being pure anymore in the genealogy of being a Hebrew, a descendant of Abraham. But yet we find that the power was in our differences. And so I, I strongly believe in it. So as I walk through this landmine of discussion, I want you to understand I'm not trying to play off on that. I'm not trying to badmouth it. But you know what? There reaches a point that we have to look at that I have to draw a line. We have to say that, okay, there's a point and I want you to not be offended by it. Whether you're watching on YouTube in the future or you're going to, there's somebody going to get offended because you're not going to agree or see it my way. And I understand that. But just for a moment, consider the logic behind what I'm going to say. So we talk about denominationalism. Again, when I went in the army, I had no clue what they were talking about. And I, they said, well, what religion are you? Because they were going to stamp it on my dog tag. And I said, well, I'm Church of Christ. They said, oh, you're, you're, you're non-denominational. You're Protestant. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Because you're Catholic, you got a Catholic stamp. Well, Catholic, you know, Jew, you got a Jew. But no, we were grouped. We're all this different 
religions and stuff. And that was my first kind of wake up when I was 17 years old looking at that and trying to understand. So now when I hear that word, I don't hear it used a lot when we say denominational. So think of currency. Money. Okay? Money. So religion. The two. I'm trying to draw a parallel here. Within money, you have denominations of, what, $1 bills? Denomination of $5 bills? But what are they? They're all money. They're all currency. So when we talk about religion, we talk about that, we say, well, we have in the religious belief, people who say they're Christians, different denominations, different types. Which that automatically says something, doesn't it? I mean, when we, when we identify that, we're calling it out. There's something different between that sets apart from all of the others. And that's important, and that's natural, and we accept that. Well, there was a wave that came along, you know, about 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, and it, it was this idea of uniting all these different denominations into one. And this is where you start going, well, what's wrong with that? Well, when I first started preaching over 22 years ago, I was here at the office and pretty naive, and we get a, a check in the mail. And I got this letter from a local organization, and it was inviting me as the pastor of all the local churches, all the different denominations, to come together and to have a lunch, bring your own lunch and stuff, and then we're going to talk about how we can win the youth and bring them to our churches. I didn't know this fancy word, you know, unity and diversity as far as applying it to religion and stuff, but I, the first thing was I thought, oh, wait a minute, Ooh. so I'm gonna, we're going to help each other bring people to God in all these different paths. And, and now, and now see, this is where I'm starting to walk on landmines because it's like, oh, we're being judgmental. But the, the simplicity of it to me was, I believe I'm right. They believe they're right. Everybody believes their own path is right. But yet we're going to come together and share how we can get people into my path or your path, and I'm okay with that. And when I was talking to somebody about it, they go, well, what's wrong with that? And I go, well, I, I mean, I'm sorry. I believe that there's one path. There's one path that we have to seek out if we're going to find salvation. That God didn't create, you know, like America's network of highways, 50,000 different ways to travel down the road to get to the same destination. That, that's never been something I've ever picked up in the simplicity of reading the Bible. So ecumenicism is this big word that is that, that concept that where we talk about bringing those together. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to look at that. Because we're, we're so divided in our country that there is no unity hardly in anything unless you're unified in your own anger, your own you know, issue you're with. But what about spiritually? We need to be united. There's a part that I think as our nation, the morality issue, that all people who are seeking out towards God need to stand up for the moral righteousness of God. Those values. I believe that. But when it comes to being comfortable with saying that any path you choose is going to get you into heaven, uh, we've got to talk about that. I, I can't go there. I'm not going to say I'm exclusively all knowledgeable about everything and that I've got it locked. I'm still growing and I'm finding that out every year that I live. But I know the Scriptures teach. And so we need to look at the idea. And so the basic objectives that I have that I want us to look at are very simple. You know, one is, what is it? Define it. Because it's important for us to understand it. Because it's happening. You won't hear these words, but you'll, you'll hopefully kind of see some of those things that are being layered on us. And be careful. I mean, I, I have, and they're beautiful friends, no matter what faith they are. I love them to death. And I don't think of anything less of them. You know, we disagree, and I'm sorry that we can't come to the same understanding but I'm not going to treat them any less than that. So I'm not trying to encourage that type of a thought. But we have to seek individually, put aside some, some contentious thoughts and this guard that we tend to throw up all of a sudden when we hear something we don't like. 
Kind of like your doctor when you go to your physical, like my last one, you know, it was a while back. But he's, you know, I'm sitting there listening to the doctor, and, and she's reading the facts to me. You know, she's saying, Ron, you're obese. Your blood pressure's high. This is going on. This is going on. And I'm sitting there going like this, and I'm fine with that at first. You know, I'm like, okay, well, those are the facts. Until then, all of a sudden, she goes, and you got to lose weight. You need to diet. And I'm like, whoa. Now, now you're meddling. You know, you're... Now you're telling me I got to do something. You know, I got to, you know, I could understand that, but, you know, I mean, so we get defensive automatically. So we talk about this is, is understand that it is happening. I want you to just be clear about that so that as you see these happenings, you'll be able to understand it and know what's going on. Stand for the truth. And the only truth is the Bible. Strip everything back and go back to just the Bible. And if you can't see it in there, then there's a problem. And if somebody ever tells you that for some reason, well, you just can't see it, let me help you, Carrie, you know, because you're just not that smart. I'm picking on Carrie. Sorry, Carrie. You know, but that's what you get looked down to sometimes. Well, Ron, you're just not, you didn't get your degree in, in, in theology, you know, you, you know, so let me help you with that Greek. God has never dealt with his people that way. God has always made it in a way that we could always understand. The simplicity is there. Paul mentions it. The other thing is, can we find it biblically? What does the Bible have to say about it? And that's where we'll hopefully be able to show some things that, that, that do stand out. So let's go back and look at the definition of ecumenicism. It's a concept and principle that Christians who belong to different Christian denominations should work together to develop closer relationships among their churches and promote Christian unity. On the surface, we should always seek peace, not create problems. But what I have seen is teachings starting to be watered down. You have to, that's where we need to be careful. Is it, you know, different basic plan of salvation cannot be compromised. I think that individually we should, you know, we have that relationship with people and that's fine. So, let's start with that and look at one fact. We don't teach the same gospel. That's a fact. I don't teach the same gospel as the other denominations. What is the gospel? It sounds innocent. Oh, well, you just teach a different gospel. Whoa, wait a minute. What is the gospel? The gospel is a completion of God's plan for salvation of mankind who lost it when he was in the garden and all that God went through. But the gospel is the edge of this plan, the completion of it, the fulfillment, the most important part of it all. And it was that his son came to this earth, became a man, lived this life with us, showed us a way that you can be a human and that not sin, that he loved people regardless of their status, and we could see the Father, as John said, in his person. We could see God the Father for the first time in a real human. That's how reflective he was of God. We know that his sacrifice was absolutely necessary. He had to die. People in that generation, while they were walking and living with him, didn't get it. They struggled with it. They argued with him. Peter, right? Peter looked at him and said, oh, no, Lord, you're not going to go up there and suffer. But we've seen people always struggling with trying to find the truth. But so the gospel is God's son came in the flesh, lived among us, sacrificed his life for us, died, and then was buried was raised from the grave, ascended, and now reigns. Now, the comp other part of that is now, how do you get into it? That's the other part of the gospel that we see that Jesus, as he gave that great commission, and he told his disciples what they were to do. That's what we mean, great commission. Here's your, your marching orders. Go, make disciples. Teach them everything that I've commanded you. And those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. Bam. That's what he instructed the apostles. The next thing we see is in the book of Acts. 
on the day of Pentecost when the apostles were gathered together, the Holy Spirit descended upon those men and all of a sudden they stood up and they started speaking about the great things of God. They're using prophecy and then as they go through, they give them the gospel, don't they? They give them the gospel. They start with Joel and go through there and they show them all the way through. This is the gospel. And when they, he doesn't even get finished with it. That's what I think is amazing. He doesn't even get finished with this lesson. And all of a sudden they're going, hey, what do we got to do to be saved? You see, that's what the gospel does. The gospel brings individuals with a pure heart that's seeking him to come to that by themselves and go, what do I need to be saved? Because as Paul said, all men have fallen short of the glory of God. All men are sinners. So we all have that equality level there that we're all sinners. And they, in that message, and that part of that gospel was, he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin. Any variation from that is a different gospel. So they teach different gospels. And here's just a few of the aspects of it. One of them is, once saved, always saved. And this is another part. Some of these I want to bring up because I've been studying a lot on Calvinism and I've been looking at, you know, the Reformation and, and doing deep dive studies and listening because I've got a lesson I've got to prepare, go up to Albuquerque and present. And, and I tell you what, it's, it's just insane to me because <laughs> there's a part of what these statements are saying that I have to say, you're right. But then it's like, Oops, you went a little too far with that. Because there is a part of this that we, those who don't believe that once saved, always saved, you know, we go the other direction. And then we feel un insecure about our salvation. And somehow that, you know, every 10 seconds, if I sin or something, I, oh, <laughs> just lost my salvation. But this is not what we're talking about. We're, we're talking about that once you have it, you got it. There's nothing you can do to really lose it. But what does the Bible teach? That's what we're going to come back. You know, what does the Bible teach about that? What can we simply look at some passages and see? In Romans 11.21, Paul says there, he says, For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. What's he talking about? In the context of this, he's talking about the idea of how the Jews were that original olive plant that brought forward this great completion of God's promises. And that they were the special olive tree and that they should have continued to be able to but because they rejected him what did he say he broke them off and tossed them and discarded them and because the gentiles were receiving it paul used the illustration of grafting them in to this root this tree this olive tree and now they're a part of that so right there, we see this idea that Paul is teaching that there were some that had this blessing that they should have been able to have and keep and keep, but he goes, no, because they rejected Christ, what happened? They were ripped out. They lost. They were tossed away. But then he turns around and warns the Gentiles who now have become one in Christ, been grafted into this great promise. He says, be careful. Because if God took what was natural and broke it out because they failed to believe, you know what he's going to do? So again, what's our conclusion? There, be careful. It's not, you're not secure. Your salvation is not a lock. Over in Hebrews 4.1, and talking about how the children of Israel had come out of the <laughs> bondage and all of that, but yet when they came to enter into that promised land, they didn't get to go. They failed to enter. Now, that's not, he's not just given a historical moment in this book of Hebrews. He's making an application of something that occurred historically and what happened to those people and what can happen to you. So that's something that actually I'm starting to dabble in my afternoon sermon because we're going through the book of Hebrews. But in 4.1, he says, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, you still have an opportunity. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So he's talking to Christians here. That's, he's talking to Hebrew Christians. And he's saying, watch out. Because just like those were delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage, they went through the water, the Red Sea, and they were chosen, but they failed to enter it 
He said that's the same thing. And then down in verse 11 of chapter 4 of Hebrews, he says, therefore, let us strive to enter that rest. It's not like you're going to get into it and then you just sit there and go, whew, got it. It's still something that we have to be concerned about, something we have to show that. He said, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. So there is a form of disobedience that can jeopardize our salvation. Once saved, always saved. You know, when we say that. And then in Philippians 2.12, Paul says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, if you were saved initially, because that's what he's talking to again, he's talking to people who are saved, why would they need to fear and tremble? Why should they be concerned at all? Now, and I'm going to, again, kind of express this point. We as Christians as well do not have a salvation that swings like a pendulum on a clock. And what I mean by that is, in other words, you're baptized, bing, you're saved. You sin, oops, you're not saved. And then you pray and then you're forgiven, oh, now you're saved. And then you sin, oops, you're not saved. Then you repent, now you're saved. And then you're not saved, not saved, 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 not saved. Boy, you'd wear that clock out. <laughs> that day would go long, wouldn't it? Because that's what was kind of presented to me by a friend of mine who doesn't believe in that, believes that I want saved, always saved, and we're discussing that. He goes, oh, Ron, so you're saying that if you're driving down University Avenue here and you looked out and you saw a woman and you had a nasty thought about her and bam, you got killed, you're going to hell. Because you lost. And I, and I started thinking about it. I go, no, of course not. not but the way that I've been taught because we go the opposite direction of saying, oh no, not once saved, always saved. Well, then what does that make us? Always worrying about it? <laughs> so see, that, that's what I mean as well. It's sometimes when we look at these, these things that divide us, we go the extreme other opposite end. And then we, we become very insecure on our own. We, wait a minute, that's logical, you know, but no, that can't be right. So wait a minute, how do I protect myself? 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. John says about fellowship, how it's obtained. Basically, it starts with our relationship with Christ, which that's why we have a fellowship. We have a relationship. And then he says there that as we sin, if we will turn to him, we are forgiven. We don't lose our salvation, but that sacrifice is continually available as we repent. We will never... Be sin free, John says. In that same book, he says, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar. And you make God a liar. So we know that we're not that insecure about our salvation. That if we're trying, we know we're going to sin, but we need to be able to have that heart that's wanting to change and repent and continue. And then you're going to sin again. And you're going to feel lost. You're going to feel so overwhelmed. Like, i just, I got to give up. I can't. And so then we start to feel like, well, and so we find the other side that, well, no, no, you can't ever lose your salvation. Wait a minute. So there's a balance here. And that blood of Jesus, that perfect sacrifice, if we understand it, that's what helps us stay in that sanctified state that he provides for us. But he says there, the fear. Now the other one, it, this, this, this really came up with the Reformation in, in 1517 A.D. with Martin Luther. And, and what I found interesting is that you know, the whole thing was almost like Martin Luther walked into this landmine of things going on politically around him that he did not realize that what he had wrote was going to trigger such an avalanche against him. And so, but, but he is, now think about it from his point of view as a Catholic. Everything is about a work. What are works? See, I, I, I'm not, I've never been raised Catholic, so I, don't underst I never could understand it. But the sacraments are works. Every one of them. Without going into all the details, they are works. And the only way you can get them is by going through the church. And so Martin Luther was having this struggle because he was, he was like, you know, doing all these works and trying to, to get right. And he said, the harder I did those things, he goes, the worse I felt. There's something wrong here. That all these sacraments and all these things that I was doing were falling short of I still don't feel right with God. Why am I not comfortable? 
What's wrong here? And so his opposition towards it was this idea that this, this religious type of organizational you know, doctrine of these type of functional ceremonial things that are being instituted by the Catholic organization church were works. And so he said, no, the sacraments don't save you. What saves you? Faith. And so he saw, that's where he, and he, he was on the right road. Because I was always perplexed by the idea that Martin didn't really like the book of James. Because the book of James, like this Dr. Ryan Reeves, I've listened to his lectures talking about it. He said, yeah, and he goes, the problem is that the average layman could go over and read James and go, well, wait a minute, Martin. You know, that says that works without faith is dead. Paul says in Romans, who is he talking to? He's talking to Jews. that There were ceremonial, legalistic, civil regulations that they had to do. And they had to fulfill those. But that wasn't what was going to save them. It was faith. And that's what Paul says about Abraham. He says Abraham was saved before Mosaic Law even showed up. Come on, guys. What saved him? God spoke, he believed it, and he did it. Now, call it what you want, actions or behavior, but it modified, and he did something. So uh, you got to listen to people when they talk about parsing out these words like works. Faith works. So, but faith only? No. You know, there's several things that the Bible teaches against that. James 2.20. James says there, he says, do you want to be shown, O foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? In other words, not this idea of the sacraments or sacrifices and things like that, but James is saying that you got to do what, what did Jesus teach when it comes to loving your neighbor and taking care of the orphan and the widows and doing things and not just sitting there and telling somebody that shows up and needs something, go, well, be warm and comfortable, we'll see you later. No, it's spurs us because of our care of want for others that it calls us and makes us act upon it to do something and so that's why the bible says that you know what it it is more it it's more than just faith by itself because otherwise he also says what about the demons in the same book he says you know what the demons have faith and they tremble remember what paul said in philippians he said tremble and fear because of your salvation i mean be careful about it and here we see in james where he says you know that even the demons tremble they have faith but they don't have work they can't they're not acting upon it they'll never change so we know that it's not just faith only but that's what's being taught so when we start talking about this united in diversity and we start teaching these concepts that are clearly not biblical. And then somebody comes along and they say, well, Ron, you know, I just have to believe. That's all I have to do. And never do anything else. Never go to church. Never help anybody. Just believe. And then they're going to do what? I mean, I mean I, I'm not comfortable with that when we see so many things that Christians were called into action and the activities that they were doing because of their faith. But that's the difference, and that's why I cannot compromise and say that we have this great unity and diversity, and I'm going to just accept everybody on that religious belief and that. So we see that. James 2.22, James also says there, he says, you see that faith was active along with his works, talking about Abraham, and faith was completed, so it's incomplete. That's the other conclusion, right? I mean, so, in other words, Abraham, that's who he's talking about, says, Abraham, take your son and sacrifice him on this mount. Okay. Abraham, it's been a week. Are you going to go? Oh, oh, Lord, I have faith. Well, are you going to go? <laughs> Lord, I believe it. You know, I have faith. I believe what you had to say. No. He had to load up the wood. He had to take his son and he had to go to where God said. Now, if you want to call that works and you're 
that, but that's an action. And that's what James is saying here, is that the knowledge comes by God's Word, and you say, I accept it, and then do nothing. Because God's Word in the New Testament tells us Christians a lot of things that we should be doing. And we just say, whoop, well, I, I, I believe, I'm good, I'm good at that. No. In verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. Now see, that's where Martin Luther had a problem. And I now respect why he could have such a concern because of what he was embattled against. But I think that's where this balance again that we have to be able to identify and see that. James 2.26, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. So to just tell somebody, all you have to do is have faith. That's it. Faith and believe. And that's, that's, that's you know, we come over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 3. I don't, I don't know how you can, you know, even the, the, the trends, the, the linguists who have gone through and gone back to the original language and stuff has not been able to change this, to make it something different. They will all agree on it, is the fact that it says what it says. Baptism, which now corresponds to this. He's talking about Noah being saved in the water. Baptism now corresponds to this now saves you. So there's something going on that's more than just that as well. Saved upon belief. All you've got to do is believe. It's kind of in the fine line there between faith and belief, you know, because you hear something, you believe. So I think I created a gray line here, but you hear that used. That all you have to do is believe. But the Bible teaches very clearly that they're dependent. That there's, you have to believe, and there's an action. That's going back to the faith. And then action, call to action. In Mark 16, 16, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. I don't know how many volumes of books have been written by men to re-justify this. And again, going back to the original language and going back to all that, you know, present orus and all that Greek stuff, you can't change the dependency upon those two because of that word in the Greek, and. And. And I, I think that everybody who reads that gets it. But that's not being taught. That you just believe that baptism isn't necessary. And I've had people say, oh, so you believe baptism is a work. And I, you know, I never got it. I was like, Phew. I'm like, well, I guess so, because you know I have to change into these coveralls and I have to go up into the water, and we, you know, yeah, I guess you could say it's a little work, right? Boy, different frame of mind. That's what I mean about understand what they say when they say, well, you believe in works, you got to have works, Ron. Not ceremonial type of things like the altar where I got to take a lamb and I got to go to Pentecost and I got to go do the sacraments, I got to pray the rosary and I got to do all these things. No! Faith in Jesus Christ saves you. That's the only way. And it's through His grace is the only thing that saves you. But in that faith, it tells us something. That's the important part. That's the key. Belief is just like I said earlier. Abraham believed in God. He heard his voice. I mean, come on. He picked up his family and moved a thousand miles away from where he lived on a whim. I mean, can you imagine Sarah going home from work and telling, hey, Sarah, pack it up. We're moving. Where are we going? I don't know. What? Where are you going? I don't know. God talked to me. I, I think Suzanne would look at me and say, Ron, are you taking your meds? <laughs> He believed, didn't he? And he packed his house up and he moved. And they have to be connected. And so when Mark says here, he who believes and is baptized. Now, does baptism save you? 
you know, like Peter says over there as well. He says, you know, it's, it's just water. It's not the washing away of something. It's not like we have to put a sin filter on the water here to make sure we get it all cleaned out because of you guys, when we were baptized, we got a floating bunch of sin in there because we washed it off you. No. But it's an absolute powerful demonstration back to the Father. And like many things, we see the symbology that God has instituted to help teach us. And what does it teach us? It teaches us what it's like to die and go into water because you can't breathe in it. And even though it's a moment, I think all of us have had to hold our breath underwater for a while and realize what's the consequences if you take a breath. So you're sealed. And that's what Paul illustrates so beautifully in Romans 6. Do you not know that as many of you are baptized or baptized into Christ, that you were buried with Him and you died with Him? And then when you came up out of that water, you were raised with Him and became anew? That's the symbology. That's the action. And that's what Jesus wants you to share with. And why would you not? Why would you not? The other one is I think of all the time is in that, that great day on the Pentecost. Is it when, G, when Peter and them were talking to them and said all that had happened, and when they asked that important question, and they said, what do we need to do to be saved? That was the key. He didn't say, you believe. You're good. Did he? Did he say, you believe? You're okay? I mean, I could almost hear it. Say, well, we just had an altar call, and everybody said they believed, and so, hey, let's go ahead and just see you Sunday. And by the way, you, you know what it would take to baptize over 3,000 people in one day? Wouldn't you schedule them out? I mean, Andrew were talking about this very thing. It was like, you know, you, I started thinking about it. You know, okay, you, you baptize more and more and more. Why, why was it so important that you baptize 3,000 in that day? And why? Now think about, you're in line. And you, let's just... Play with me here. You pulled your number and you're 2,099. But you stayed. You stayed. Because you knew the importance. I don't care. I'm 2,099. But man, I'm going to be baptized. You don't see him going up and say, Hey, Peter, can we schedule this? Can I come back next month? Can, is it something that I can... They got it, man. They saw the urgency. They saw their sinful condition. And man, they wanted to fix it that day. They believed. And then they just went home. <laughs> we can't stand in line for grocery stores at Walmart. We got all these self-checkouts. And I'm checking the shortest line. I can't stand to stand behind four people. But if you were the 2,099th person and you stayed, doesn't that say something to us today? What a message. The other idea that is being taught by these different Gospels that we're trying to unite with is that somehow sin is inherited. Now, I inherited a lot of bad habits. I got that. You know, my boys inherited some things from me that are bad. But this idea that I'm being condemned because of my father's. And... And, and again, it comes back to Catholicism. It really does. And I'm not beating up on the Catholics. It's a fact. And it has some logical sense in the base there. Because what did we inherit coming out of the garden? Was it genetic? Eh, what did we get? We inherited a condition, didn't we? Anybody been in the garden? Nope. Anybody living forever? Nope. Anybody perfect? No. So yeah, there's a part where we inherited a condition, but you know what? We're no better. We're just repeating the same mistakes. But to say that somehow my great-grandpappy did some awful sin, and now I'm going to be held accountable for God for what he did? And what type of God is this? Then man, none of us are making it out of here. We're not going anywhere good. But that's okay. They say, you know, that, that's inherited. So coming back, what does the Bible teach? 
Well, let's go to the prophets. Now you say, oh, Ron, you're going to the Old Testament. Absolutely. Because you see, through the prophets is where you get this great idea and concept of how wonderful God is. And you hear the conversations God's having. And this is God speaking here. Isaiah's voice, but God is speaking this. What does he say? The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer the iniquity for the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. So, no. You're going to suffer some social consequences maybe because your, your father, your parents were, uh, made some bad decisions, and yes, you're going to have some of that. You're gonna, we get those things from our parents. Some might be born with a silver spoon and some with a shovel. <laughs> There's some of that. And maybe consequences because maybe my father did some terrible things and now we live so poor and we suffered and things like that. But that's not God. That's choices. There's a difference between the actual sin. So coming back to this idea, this is a statement, a very bold statement, and this is a guy who is an apologist, in other words, for the Catholic Church. He wrote a book. It's called Ecumenical Jihad. And I want you to read it with me. There are Buddhists, there are Hindus, there are Confucians, there are Muslims, there are atheists, there are Orthodox Jews, all in heaven because Christ is not the issue. The gospel's not the issue. The Bible's not the issue. Sincerity and goodness is the issue. Sincerity and goodness. Just be sincere. About what? I know a lot of people who have made some terrible mistakes, but they were very sincere. Hitler was very sincere. You say, no, come on, Ron. You went there? Yes. He was genuine. He thought that that's exactly what he needed to do that was going to make the race better and improve the world. And we see how twisted that... No, sincerity. It doesn't come from our hearts, the proverb writer says. We can't look within. So can we accept that? Does Scripture support that? That's where we come down and look at that. Does the Scripture support that? Well, we can look at some writings very clearly that start to bring that out to light. One, Jesus taught there's only one way. And I know everybody here is familiar with this one verse. What does He talk about? The gate. Remember that? Was that because, no, look at 7, 13, and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter in it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Does that sound like everybody's saved? Does it sound like, no, it's work, it's hard. Oh, I said that word work, sorry. <laughs> it, it's an effort. But there's not multiple gates. Multiple denominational gates. There's one path. We see that Paul warns about the gospel. We're probably familiar with this one in Galatians chapter 1. How quickly he says, I had delivered to you one message, a complete message. I mean, it was so complete that he said later on in the, around this same passage that if I or an angel or anybody else comes back and teaches you anything else, curse them. Paul says, even if I come back and go, you know what, guys, I got it wrong. You don't need baptism. Oh, you know what? You've got to dance on your head on Sunday mornings. No matter, it sounds silly, but no matter what, Paul says. And you say, well, wait a minute. You brought us the initial truth. He goes, no, you got it. It's delivered. But he was just floored by the concept that he says, I am astonished that so quickly you're discerning him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another. Each denomination is teaching different, different Gospels. You're going to have to find it. You're going to have to seek it for yourself and check and make sure you evaluate it. The Apostle Paul, look at some of the things that, that even looking at Paul here, he disputed with teachings of circumcision. He just didn't welcome him. Say, that's okay. You can teach circumcision. Unity and diversity. Bring all those Jews. No. No. He contended directly with him, didn't he? He didn't accept it. He told the Athenians when he was there, no, there's no, there's only one God. All those gods you have, all those religions, all those denominations of gods, there's only one. And God, you know what the end of it said? And God has appointed a day in a man that's going to judge everyone. 
by that one standard. We also see that, you know, the efforts because of, and I love the story where the young boys, the priests, try to go and cast out the devil, the demons. And I, I'm getting off, off, but what happened was they couldn't do it. And when Paul's able to cast them out, these demons jump on those boys and whoop them. And I'm really paraphrasing them harshly. But when the people saw that and they clicked, you know what they did? They burned all their books. They burned all the, they went and got all their sorcery books and they just took them and they burned them up. He didn't say, oh, it's okay. You got that sorcery. You got that belief. You got that. No. The people did that. They understood very quickly. He tells us to identify false teachers. Unity and diversity, there are no false teachers. Nobody's false. Everybody, you have your own place. We'll bring this together in this one passage here. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, 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 one. Not multiple makes one. Multiple different ways makes one. So I hope that it helped you. And I hope that maybe you learned something from it. And I hope that the way that I presented it wasn't I didn't do something to cause and misrepresent the truth. That you'll take a moment to think about it. I do not want to cause anyone to be hateful. I don't want to sit and, I, and I have, I'm very uncomfortable judging others. Because we, like he said, we, you, individually need to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Not by the churches. Not by the denominations. You, individually, each one, need to find the truth. It's available. It's in the Bible. So with all this information, I hope that it's helped you and encouraged you. If there's something we can do to help you in your relationship with Him, I hope that you'll let us have that opportunity at this moment. We're going to be singing the invitation song. It's an opportunity for each of us, no matter if you're a Christian or not, to look within our own heart, look at our lives, and then make the necessary change change away from the life that we live and become a Christian or change back and take access, take advantage of that precious blood that is offered there for us. So think about these things while we stand and we sing.